Hi everybody, welcome to United. If you don't already know me, my name's Kara and this is Mackenzie. And here at United, we exist to point students towards Jesus. Now, one way we do that is through these things called connect cards. So if you look in front of you, you can grab that. And if you're new, you can fill out this bottom section and take it to the back after worship. Now, there's going to be this guy back there. His name's Tyler. He's a little goofy, but if you go tell him your favorite ice cream flavor, he'll give you a free t-shirt after worship. Yes, guys, and I highly encourage you to do that because I remember my first time at United, and it was a little bit intimidating and scary for me. But I went to the back connect room, just like all of you, and it made me feel very reassured and more like I was at home because I was getting to know the people that I was surrounding myself with. And now here I am as a senior about to be recognized on Senior Sunday. So seniors, if you do not already know this, on Sunday, May 22nd, yeah, May 22nd at Big Church, both 9 and 11 service, um, Beach Church would like to recognize us. And so I'd highly encourage you all go because it's something super sweet that they're doing for all of us and our student band will be taking over. Now the same day, May 22nd, it'll be the same United time, but it's going to be our last worship of the year. So there's going to be baptisms and it's just going to be a great way to celebrate all that God has done throughout the year. Yes, so speaking of worship, um, our student worship band is not possible without you and so and your amazing talents. So if you are interested or know anybody interested in trying out for um, our worship band, at the end of the service, you can go to the Connect Room and they'll give you the link to um, fill out the application and you will get to know Rachel, and which is the leader of the worship band. And it's just a really fun opportunity, so I really recommend you all do it. Now everybody stand up and we're going to transition into a time of worship.
welcome you in this place tonight. Holy Spirit, overflow. Can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I Unless 
Jesus, that we can worship you, that we have that freedom to lift our hands, to raise our hands and worship you, to scream your name, to praise you, God. Thank you for always being there in the middle of the storm. Thank you for being that safe place, that safe house to to run to. Thank you for never leaving our side, even when we know we can't do it alone. Thank you for always staying there, no matter how far we tried to run from you. You never left our side, God. Amen. God is good, why is there mental illness? Okay, United, how we doing tonight? Wow, so excited to be here, so excited to see your beautiful, lovely faces, from what I can see. Um, Welcome to United. If you weren't here last week, this is currently our series called Any Questions? And last week, um, Pastor Ryan did an amazing job discussing and answering the question of, if God is good, then why is there suffering? And if you weren't here last week, I highly recommend you go back, listen to it, because it was really helpful. Um, But this week, Ryan ain't here, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Um, Actually, he is on a well-deserved vacation. So um, sometime during this week, if you want to shoot him a text, just thanking him, telling him to relax and have a nice time, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. But um, in his absence, he has asked yours truly to be here to speak to tonight. Um, Yeah, thanks. Wow, in the back. Love you guys. (laughs) Um, And it's kind of fitting because of the question that we're discussing this evening is, if God is good, then why is there mental illness? And um, it's a tough question, right, to think about these really serious things, things that have impacted maybe your own life, things that have impacted the lives of people you love, people you care about. And so we're going to do our best to kind of have that conversation tonight. Um, For those of you who don't know, I am a licensed mental health counselor, and I've worked in the hospital setting. I've worked in the outpatient setting, Uh, foster care is where I'm currently working, and in schools. And kind of my specialty area would be uh, children, adolescents, and their families. So I'm kind of up here speaking from my experiences as a clinician, but also from my experiences just as a believer in Jesus, someone who loves him and he is Lord and Savior of my life. So I'm kind of taking those two things Um, into mind as I speak tonight. And I love talking about mental health in church because, well, a few reasons. I think, first of all, it's a topic that churches have kind of like shied away from. Um, Or if they haven't shied away from it, oftentimes they've really given out or projected some damaging uh, messages about mental health and religion and faith in Jesus. And so... I like being able to have complicated, complex conversations. You know what I'm saying? And I'm appreciative that Beach Church and Beach Students is setting us up to have conversations like this tonight. So are you ready? Okay. All right. So this series called Any Questions. When you were younger, let's say like four, five, six, and you went to your parent and you asked a question. Like, hey, mom, Aunt Judy had a baby. Where did that baby come from? 
And your parents would probably answer something like this. I'll tell you when you're older. I'll tell you when you're older. How many times have y'all gotten that response? I'll tell you when you're older. I'll explain it when you're older. Or the dreaded, you'll understand when you're older, honey, okay? (laughs) I used to get that response all the time. And so I had this idea in my head that I was going to like turn 18 and they're like, here's the book of all the answers that you've always asked that nobody ever answered. You get the answers. Welcome to adulthood. That didn't happen. And so I actually found out, well, okay, I do know where babies come from. (laughs) Thank you. I keep doing this number. That's interesting. Um, (laughs) So, um, but there were a lot of things that I didn't get answered. And in fact, for every answer I did get about life, I feel like I've gotten five, 10, 15 more questions. So let's talk about things that I don't understand. First of all, airplanes. Don't get me started on airplanes. Because your whole life, right? They're like, ooh, gravity, gravity. You know, if you, if I take this and I drop this, it falls to the ground. Why? Gravity. But you're telling me that an airplane a bajillion times the weight of that whatever can just fly in the air. Okay? And then not only can the object of the airplane fly in the air, but we're going to put a whole bunch of people on the airplane, and they're all going to bring their stuff, and then we're going to fly them across the ocean. It's infuriating, really. I don't get it. Well, I get it. I took physics, okay? But I don't get it. Item number two, the stock market. Okay. Uh, Does Coach Banks still teach economics at Fletcher? Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. Okay. I don't understand the stock market. Okay. Like, I get it. I'm starting a company. I want to spread out the risk and get the capital to start my company. So if I fail, then, then it's not all on me. But if I succeed, we all make money. And there's the NASDAQ and there's the Dow and they're up and down all the time. And it's the president's fault somehow. And then you have, you have inflation and you have the gas prices and I get it. I don't think I get it. Okay. This one, don't feel targeted. This. I can't even do it. (laughs) This side tongue thing. Let's talk about it. And if you do that, that's all right. You stick out your tongue all you want. But (laughs) what I really don't understand is when you say something like really intense, like, well, you know, crippling anxiety from childhood trauma. (laughs) What is that? I cannot right now. (laughs) Okay. Um, And the last one, and I'm going to get some hate for this, and I'm ready for it. I'm a strong, independent woman. (sighs) Harry Styles. I don't think I get, like, I get it. I get it. I just don't get it. You know what I mean? Like the ones, like the people who are like, oh, I really love Harry. I'm sure he's a lovely young gentleman, but I just don't get it. So there are all of these things that we don't understand, but let's be honest, airplanes and stock market and things, the side tongue thing, I don't even know what you call that. Those really aren't the questions that bother us, are they? I mean, those aren't the questions that keep you up at night. I, uh, I think a lot, I call them ceiling questions because they're the questions you think about when you lie in bed staring at your ceiling at 2 a.m. Those are the questions that bother us, right? Those are the questions that we want answers for. And so tonight, I think as we discuss this topic of mental health, mental illness, I think it's just an opportunity to explore the why. But I have a a warning about why questions. A lot of times we ask why and we expect that when we have an answer, it's gonna make it all better. But it might not. Did anyone leave last week and it's like, okay, I I get it why they're suffering, but when I'm in the midst of suffering, it still hurts. It's kind of like a, um, 
a shot you get at the doctor. Like, I get why I have to get the shot, but when I get it, that hurts, right? And so that's my warning about as we look into the why. I hope it gives you understanding, but if you leave feeling like, that's it? I didn't have like some huge revelation. That's okay. But the important thing is, is that we're having the conversation. We're trying to look through and see what God has to say about mental health and explore why it exists. So the first question is, um, well, really the question for the whole night is, if God is good, then why is there mental illness? So I want us to look at it from like a theological perspective. So we're going to zoom out, meaning why does... Not why does mental, why do I have mental health uh, diagnoses, but like in general, why does it exist? And I'm gonna give you my best breakdown, the best I can kind of come up with from what I read in scripture. So I believe that in the beginning, Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And I love, uh, my niece Sinclair does this thing where she's Spider-Man and she goes, web, 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 right? And I just kind of, that's not what God was doing, but I imagine, right, he's just like, bleh you know, and it's like oceans and word and it's, and I don't know, like seas and, and mountain ranges. And he's like, a uh, thing in the air, that's a bird and we got a fish and we're gonna make a horse and then we're gonna take a horse but give him stripes and call it a zebra. You know, what is that? Is a zebra a horse? More questions all the time. Okay, so he's just spitting out words and creation is, is, is unfolding. And then it comes time to make humans. And he makes man in his own image. And the Bible says he breathes life into humanity. Life in the garden was good. There was no disease. There was no mental illness. There was no war or famine or poverty. Everything was how God intended it to be. Oh, but then came Genesis 3, just two short chapters later, and we see that sin enters into the world. And, you know, I think I used to simplify this a bit, right? So when sin came into the world, when Adam and Eve ate the apple or the mango, I don't know what they ate, and sin came into the world, I thought, okay, now humans can choose between right and wrong. Sin has come into the world. But it's so much more than that. It's so much more pervasive than that. I didn't really think this through, but welcome to my life. Here we have a mirror. So I like to think that this was, do you see yourselves? Yes, ladies, gents, looking good. I like to think that in the beginning, creation was perfect. Everything was how it was meant to be. Now let's imagine with this mirror, I say, okay, well, I'm just gonna put a little hole in the corner. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess up the whole thing. I just wanna put a little hole in the corner. Okay, will that work? What's, what do you think's gonna happen? Oh. I, I almost heard it. <laughs> Here we are, there she goes. Okay, I'm just gonna make a little hole in the corner of the mirror. <laughs> Didn't work the first time. Okay, there we are. That was kind of like when sin entered the world. And it wasn't just one small hole, right? I don't, I don't wanna like put glass everywhere. But everything has become distorted, right? This, is, this mirror was not how it was originally created. It has fractured, that one point of impact has fractured the entire mirror. And that's how I really think about sin entering the world, that it entered the world at that point in Genesis 3, but it fractured all of creation. That what we see around us is not the creation that God originally created, that it's broken, that it is prone to decay, that now when sin came into the world, it fractured all of the creative order. And now we have mental illness, cancer, disease, famine, drought, war, conflict, all of these things. 
And so from a theological perspective, and I don't know if that makes sense to anybody or if it was just cool that I broke a mirror. I think that might be bad luck, but we don't believe in luck, so whatever. Um, <laughs> but our bodies and our minds are not as God originally designed. And so that's kind of how I make sense of it in my head as to why we have mental illness. Now you might say, okay, that's well and good. I want to know why I struggle with it, or I want to know why my mom or my dad or my, my friends struggle with it. So here is kind of, I like using objects to make things make sense, because this is how I think. We're going to look at some causes of mental illness. And what we want a lot of times is this causes this. It's simple. I want to know the cause and the effect. So make it easy. Tell me what I need to do or what's causing my depression, because then guess what? I'm just going to go and undo it. Easy. Easy, right? That's not how it works. Mental illness is more like this. This is what it's like. So when you go into therapy, What's causing my depression? It's like, well, where do we start? You know what I mean? Like, there are four um, packages of yarn in this ball. So where's the beginning? What color was there in the beginning? What color did I start with? We have no idea. It is tangled. Ooh. It is messy. It is complicated. And all of the causes and, um, that I'm going to discuss, they all weave together in very complex, complicated ways, okay? So it's complicated, but just keep, keep yarn in mind, okay, as we're going through this. So I think we have a list of them, and these are just some of them. So we have genetics, right? So little uh, DNA lesson for you. Half of your DNA comes from your mama, half of your DNA comes from your daddy, that happens and this is you, okay? And so what we're finding with mental health is it runs in families. So if, you're, if one or more of your parents, biological parents have depression, you're two, times, two to three times more likely to have depression. Anxiety, I believe it's, uh, let's see, seven times more likely. Awesome. Bipolar, four times. Schizophrenia is eight times. ADHD, so if one or more of your parents have ADHD, uh, there's a 50% chance you'll have it as well. So for some people, they're like, oh, wow, that's great. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. And then other people are like, okay, so I'm screwed. Is that what you're saying? Um, but it's not 100%. It's just increasing the likelihood. So a lot are caused um, by genetics. We have prenatal factors. If your parents use drugs or alcohol, or maybe um, your mom had high blood pressure when she was pregnant with you, there are all sorts of things that can contribute to it. We have biology. So there are parts of your body and of your brain that are just operating a little bit differently. So for example, with depression, generally speaking, your serotonin levels are lower. So serotonin, it, it helps you to feel happiness, to process emotion. You have generally a lower amount of that. With anxiety, there's this part of your brain called the limbic system, somewhere up there, and it's overactive, meaning when it should shut off, it's still going all the time. We also have like ADHD. Your prefrontal cortex is right here. Um, it's not fully operational like other parts of your brain. They're kind of compensating for your prefrontal cortex. Most of that meant nothing to you, but here's what you should take from it. There's reasons in your body and in your brain as to why you, you're having these symptoms. Um, family conflict and dynamics is kind of a joke in psychology because we're lame that everything goes back to your parents and it's all their fault. There's some truth to that. <laughs> um, so how you were raised, if your parents are together, if they're separate, if there was fighting, if you moved around a lot, any of those kind of life events, which is the next one, can impact mental health. Um, drug and alcohol use. Um, nobody here uses drugs or alcohol because you're underage and it's illegal. Okay. Um, yeah, so there is actually, there are certain mental illnesses that are induced, we call them like substance induced um, mental illness. So uh, like I met this kid one time and he, he did a drug, didn't know what it was, and he's like psychotic now for the rest of his life. He's not 
with us. Um, and his dad gave it to him. So drug and alcohol use, um, your brains are forming and they're developing and you're putting these substances into your brain and into your body. And some of y'all are getting real risky. And I'm not, I'm gonna put this finger away because I'm not trying to point any fingers, but some of y'all are getting real risky with like fentanyl and like all these drugs that you're just, pills. And it's, it's scary. Um, it's scary to know the effects. I know like my husband's here. I don't even know how many, fr he went to Fletcher High School. I don't know how many friends have died over the years just from drug use. So, but it can also kind of initiate a lot of mental health disorders. Trauma is a big one, especially childhood trauma. The more negative things that occur in your life at a young age, and I'm not talking about trauma like my dad took my cell phone. No, we're talking about physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, even surviving natural disasters, things like that. Your personality and your temperament. Some people have just like, oh, well, she's kind of always been anxious or she's always been hard to read. So some of it's kind of your personality, parenting style, social media. Whew, I have social media. I'm not trying to hate on social media. But I think we're, I think a lot of the increase in mental health concerns are because y'all are inundated all of the time with everything. And your brains at this point in your development are not intended to know what's happening countries over in such vivid detail. And so I think that's a huge part of it. Uh, COVID, how many kids have I talked to? And I said, well, when did it all begin? And they said, well, it was the spring of 2020. And I said, heck yes, it was. It's COVID done messed us all up, you know what I'm saying? But especially at this time in your life where you're, de you know, you're developing and your brain is forming and you're trying to figure out social relationships, we locked you up in your house for two years. And then you come back and you're like, oh crap, I gotta be around people? I have to talk with people? So social anxiety is through the roof. If you struggled at all with depression and then we basically said stay home all the time, that is like a, the breeding ground for more and more depression. So COVID, huge factor. Peer relationships, y'all are real mean to each other. All humans are mean to each other. But I've, when I worked at the hospital, just, I mean, I'm not going to shout out all your schools, but people from all schools, like Fletcher and DA, Paxson, Stan, I mean, we were having kids from all Duval schools. And half the time they sit and they, they tell me these stories and goodness gracious. Okay, medical conditions, your thought patterns, all of these things working together. Oh, not that one. Working together in very complex ways to cause mental illness. Um, so what do I do? That's a good question. What do I do if I'm struggling? First of all, please. For the love of all things Harry Styles, <laughs> do not diagnose yourself. I know, I know, you took psychology in 10th grade. I know, I know you follow a lot of accounts on TikTok that talk about mental illness and you've done a lot of Google searching. That is wonderful. You're still not a mental health provider. Okay, and so what I see a lot of times is you kind of get in your head, you know, and this book, it's a very heavy book, and it cost me like $300 for a friggin' book. Don't, don't get me started. Okay, so this book right here has all of the criteria for every mental health disorder that we've identified. I had to go to six years of school, pay a whole bunch of money, take a test, I had to see, do thousands of hours of therapy while someone would like tell me what I was doing right, tell me what I was doing wrong, all to get to a place where I can diagnose people. And so has, I don't think anyone here has done that. No, I know we got some people on their way, but a lot of times you take on this role of, well, I'm gonna diagnose myself, or I know what's going on, or I'm definitely depressed. Um, and a lot of times you're kind of missing it because it's, it's, a, it's very nuanced and it, um, it just takes experience. And so don't diagnose yourself. Do see a therapist. Who's had a bad experience with a therapist? They are bananas, right? I am one, get it? Um, okay, so don't hate us all because you had a poor experience. 
um, a lot of times you kind of have to shop around for a therapist. Just like you have really great teachers, you have really horrible teachers, you have awesome doctors, not so great doctors. The same is true of therapists. And you have to find one that kind of is your style. So like I went to a therapist one time and she was all like, let's meditate together and let's just calm. That's not me. Okay, that's just not my personality. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's just not me. So you have to find the right fit. Usually give people three sessions, I would say, to kind of determine whether or not it's a good fit for you. After the third session, if you're like, what? Then maybe go ahead and try to find someone else. Um, let me see what's next on my list. Move my giant book, that's really expensive. Oh. Talk to a safe adult. So I know this is when you're like, ah, I want to talk to my friends. Great. Love it that you can talk to your friends. But you do have to eventually talk to an adult. And um, that's probably going to include, don't hate me for it, your parents. Mm. Here's the reason why your parents have to get involved is because if you want to see a therapist more long term, if you want to start medication, they're your legal guardians. So they're going to have to be a part of that. Um, you can get crisis counseling if you're over the age of 13, and that's okay. You can do that without your parents' consent. But if you're going into like long-term therapy, they're gonna have to kind of sign off on some forms and pay the money. Um, so eventually you need to bring your parents into it, which I know can be difficult for some people. Um, some of your family situations are a lot, a lot. And so bringing your parents in is like, it's too much. It's, it's too much, I can't handle it. Um, so maybe telling someone like your life group leader and they can help you talk to your parents and kind of be in your corner a little bit. Um, medication. Um, I guess it's kind of controversial whether or not you should take medication for mental health, depression, anxiety, ADHD, what have you. Um, for some people, remember what I was talking about biology and genetics? For some people, if it kind of goes back to your genetics or your biology, you can go to all the therapy you want and you might, you might still struggle because your chemical balances in your brain and body are not right. Does that make sense? Kind of like if I'm diabetic and I can change the way that I eat, but I still probably need some insulin just because I'm diabetic. So there are some diagnoses where you might need medication. Um, I do not believe there's anything wrong with that. What I don't love is when we jump to medication first. You know, that's, that's pretty intense. I feel like we should probably talk to someone first and get, the, get a chance to kind of tell them what you're going through, really explore the, the ball of yarn that is your life before just throwing you on medication. Um, medication will not fix everything. Right? There are some thought patterns, uh, there are some habits, there are some behaviors that you've been operating in for years. And so you have to work on those things. You have to talk through those things. You might have to sit down with your family and work through some of the conflict. Tell your parents what you think about them, how you feel about how they've um, treated you, things that they've said, things that they've done. Medication can't fix that, right? That comes through the work you do in conversation and in therapy. And I think the last thing what, when it comes to what do we do, a lot of times it's like, well, I have to choose medication or praying. Praying? Praying. <laughs> I have to choose going to therapy or um, reading the Bible. And I don't know why we think that way. Why do we have to pick? Why, why can't we do and, right? I can pray and I can read my Bible and I can go to therapy and maybe I take medication. So kind of changing our minds from, well, it has to be this or that to going like, maybe I can do all of those things. Like if I told you that I was diagnosed with cancer, would you tell me, okay, well, you're gonna have to choose chemotherapy or praying? No, that'd be ridiculous. We would probably do both, right? So why is it different for our mental health? Um, now, what about if you have a friend that's struggling? Anybody ever have a friend come to you and they're like, here's what's going on in my life, and you're like, whoa, that's really heavy. 
I think um, I wanted to speak to that just for a second because I've had so many people say, you know, like, oh, well, my f I was dating someone and they said, if I break up with them, they're going to kill themselves. Or I am in this friendship and she says if she doesn't talk to me every night, then she might hurt herself. Those are really heavy situations, right? Um, and you're kind of put in a place that you shouldn't be put in. And so in any healthy relationship, you have to have boundaries, okay? So your role in that person's life is as their friend, not their therapist. And they're, the more you kind of move into or try to be their therapist, your helping might actually be hurting them and hurting yourself because you're carrying something that you're not meant to carry. You're carrying something you're not trained to handle. And that's really heavy. And I think um, there are two options, especially when people are, if you don't do this, I will hurt myself or I will end my life. Kind of two, thing, two options with that. Either they truly mean it and they need help, more help than you can give them, or they're saying that to manipulate you, in which case they need help, more help than you can give them. So either option, they need something more that's, that's not you. But I know that puts you in a weird position. And so sometimes it's good to tell someone like, hey, they're saying this to me. I don't know what to do. And it's just too much. And um, get, once again, responsible adult, hopefully involved. Um, Okay, self-harm, suicidal thoughts, um, those are pretty common as well. I think we have definitely see them on the rise of people having thoughts of ending their life or intentionally harming themselves through cutting or burning or something like that. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to know that not everyone who self-harms wants to end their life. There are lots of reasons that people hurt themselves. Still, we need to get into some therapy. We need to figure out ways to express those feelings um, and make sure you're safe. And I think also, um, especially when I worked at the hospital, we saw such an increase of people having thoughts of ending their life. So that's a very real thing, I think, especially facing your generation right now. Um, so talking to someone, telling them you're having these thoughts. Sometimes it's like, well, I'm going to be hospitalized. That's not always the case. You have passive suicidal thoughts, or which are kind of like, um, I, I don't, I think the world would be better off without me. If life is going to be this hard my whole life, I don't want to do it. I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up. Thoughts like that. And then you have more active thoughts where it's like, I have a plan and I'm going to figure out how to do this plan. And I'm going to do this thing in two weeks. Um, especially if it's active like that, we got to move on that quickly. Um, we need to talk to someone. If you're more in that passive stage, maybe let's get into talk with a therapist and kind of see where that's coming from. If you hear anything tonight, it's definitely tell someone, tell someone, tell someone, tell someone. Now you might say, well, I don't want X, Y, Z to happen, but our main goal is to keep you safe to keep you here with us and to get you whatever help you need. Um, so I kind of wanted to end this time. Um, we are gonna do like a little chat um, where y'all get in your groups. If you were here last week, we get in groups and just answer some questions. But um, I just wanna make sure it's clear that of all we talked about tonight, I want you to know that mental illness is not caused by your lack of faith. You see, when I put up all those things up there, lack of faith was not on there. Um, struggling with your mental health is not a reflection of your relationship with Jesus. There are plenty of people who have wonderful relationships with Jesus, and they still struggle. And you can't pray it away, and you, can, you can't read the Bible enough to kind of address some of these things, right? We need to get into therapy and potentially some medications. We need to address everything that's going on. And I think whenever we talk about mental illness in church, I think the enemy would want to kind of come into your mind tonight and say, ooh, God's mad at you. God hates you. You wanna end your life, you're hurting yourself? Ooh, he doesn't want anything to do with you. And I, 
that couldn't be further from the truth. Because the God that I read about in the Bible says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. God wants to be your anchor. He wants to be your foundation, right? The rock that you're standing on. So even if a storm comes and the rain is pouring and the wind is blowing and life is so hard, he's like, I got you. I'm your firm foundation. I'm not going anywhere. You think I can't handle a storm? You think I can't handle depression and anxiety? Just come to me. Just come to me. He wants to fight with you. He wants to fight for you. But so often we just kind of push him away and say, no, no, no. You can't come into this area of my life. And he's like, I want to be Lord of all. I want to be father. I want to be savior. I want to be friend, even in this moment. Even in this moment. Depression might be saying you're alone. But my God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says, I'm close to the brokenhearted. Depression says, no one will understand. But the Bible says, we don't have some high priest who's unable to empathize with us. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows. Anxiety is gonna kind of get into your head and say there's danger around every corner. God says, cast your cares on me. I will sustain you. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I will help you. Anxiety says, this storm is going to overtake you. You're not going to make it. But Jesus in the Bible, he stood in the middle of the storm and he said, hush, be still. And the storm and the wind and the waves obeyed him. Addiction wants to say, you'll never be free. You can't survive without me. But the Bible says, I can do all things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know that the spirit of God is in me and where the spirit of the Lord is, there will be freedom. ADHD whispers, you're different. You're weird. But did you know you were knit together in your mother's womb? There's nothing about you that is an accident. Eating disorders say, you're not good enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not pretty enough. But the Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That you were bought at a price. And that price was the Son of God on a cross. Suicidal thoughts will come in and they say, you have no purpose. There's no point. But my God says, I know. I know the plans I have for you. They're not to harm you, but I want to give you a hope and a future. You're a chosen priesthood, a holy nation. Maybe your trauma comes in and says, this is all your fault. You're worthless. You'll never be whole. But I have seen that God will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good. Turn it for good. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor dead, nor depression, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar, schizophrenia, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God, the 
love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My faith in Jesus isn't there to tear me down when I'm struggling. All of those verses are talking about a God that is near. Because aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of carrying this on your own? It's exhausting. It is exhausting. The Father's arms are open. He just says, come to me. And there might not be a quick fix, and we might be on this journey for a little while, but he's never failed us yet. So I'm gonna take a moment uh, before we uh, just ask a few questions. Actually, it might be over time. We might not do the questions. <laughs> um, but I do wanna pray over y'all. Um, I know that was a lot to cover, even myself as I'm speaking, I'm like, that was a whirlwind. That was everywhere. But I know in a room this size, with all of you, there are people who need prayer. You need um, to know that God loves you, that God sees you, that he's not distant and angry, but he wants, he wants to come close. And so, um, if you go ahead and close your eyes, bow your head. If you feel comfortable and you don't, you don't have to, but if you would say, yeah, um, I've been struggling or maybe even someone I know, a friend, a family member has been struggling with mental health. If you would just raise your hand. here's the thing, even if uh, you don't have your hand raised, you probably know someone, you just don't know that you know someone. Um, you can go ahead and put your hands down. Um, so I just want to pray over us kind of before we end this time together. God, I thank you that you know all things, that you see through us to the deepest part of us. You know the struggles that are in this room. You know the questions in this room. You know the tears that have been cried, the words that have been yelled, the thoughts that run through each and every person's head, the heaviness that they felt in their hearts. And it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. And God, it doesn't, doesn't always make sense. Sometimes we're angry about the situations that we're facing, but I pray that every person here would know that they are loved, that they are seen, that they were uniquely created by the God of all the universe. God, I pray for those here who have somehow heard messages from the church, from Christians, from whoever, that mental illness or poor mental health or struggles means that they're weak, that they're broken, that they can't be whole, that they must not be a good Christian. And God, I just pray that in those parts where those words have been damaging, that you would be our healer that you would be our healer. God, that tonight, through my very flawed words, God, that you would have stirred something in someone's heart to have a conversation, to reach out for help, to tell someone something, that boldness would rise in their souls. God, we love you. We honor you. And we draw close. We don't want to carry the burden on our own anymore. And we thank you that when we call on your name, you show up. You show up. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, big surprise. I talked too long. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we were going to do some small groups, but I'm actually, we're just not going to do that because it is 745. Um, and it's time to go. But I did want to say, um, 
I will be here for a little while if someone does need to talk. Um, I can't do like 50 counseling sessions because then we'll be here till next Tuesday. Um, but I, I did want to offer that if you did need to just like chat about something or um, yeah, anything, I'll be here. I have a few announcements, just kidding. Um, a few announcements, middle school night. Hey, hey, middle schoolers, let me see again. That's what's up. It is May 9th, 6.30. I'm pretty sure it's in this room. So if you're middle school, come on down on May 9th. And the last thing, we are having a baptism meeting tonight. Surprise. It'll be short. It'll be quick. But if you're interested in being baptized, you can go with upstairs and someone will be there. It's a mystery. How fun. Okay. And you can just get some information about being baptized. All right. Love you guys. Mean it. Like I said, I'll be here. We'll see you next week.